that. Um, thank you all for coming back. Uh, for those of you who were here last time, welcome to uh, the newcomers. Um, for those of you in Europe, I'm hoping that uh, much of what I'm going to show you today will be entirely new because American synagogues tend to be um, not overlooked but underlooked um, in, the, in the literature. And I would say in the last uh, 20 or 30 years in my own, during my own career, the level of documentation and scholarship on European synagogues uh, and even synagogues in, in Asia, North Africa, and uh, of course in Israel has um, grown dramatically exponentially, but uh, we have been far behind in documenting uh, our own Jewish heritage, the physical manifestations of our Jewish culture here uh, in the United States. Um, there are uh, a number of people who've been uh, diligent in collecting information, collecting photographs, uh, old and new, and, uh, and sharing information. We do a lot of that through the International Survey of Jewish Monuments, uh, but really we're just uh, still scratching the surface. Two of the projects that we've uh, embarked upon, or actually three of the projects we've embarked upon recently, is the documentation of mid-century modern synagogues, which I'll be talking about next week when we talk about uh, modernism. And uh, we're also documenting uh, synagogue uh, decoration, especially wall painting. And you'll see some of that uh, in today's lecture and also stained glass, which you will not see too much of today, but it is a, um, a new and developing uh, project. And we're working with uh, a number of people around the country to identify, document, and to photograph uh, the surviving uh, synagogue stained glass in older synagogues and also to do better documentation of the more modern synagogue from the post-World War II, uh, from the more modern period, from the post-World War II period. Um, and you'll see some of that, uh, some of the wall painting and a little bit of stained glass today, and more of the stained glass uh, next week. Um, American synagogues, well, actually, before I begin with American synagogues, I actually want to uh, uh, make a correction. I inadvertently said something very silly. Uh, in my talk last week, uh, I certainly know better. Uh, it was a throwaway line and fortunately uh, only one person seems to have caught it, but I was aware of it when I, when I uh, made the remark. I uh, showed uh, some quick shots of the Alt Neuschul, the uh, oldest uh, standing in use synagogue in, in Europe, um, when we were looking at medieval uh, Ashkenazi buildings, and I pointed out the tympanum over the entranceway between the narthex and the, and the, and the prayer hall, and I referred to the clusters on this vine uh, as, as pine cones. And of course, they're not pine cones. This is a vine, and those are funny-looking uh, bunches of grapes, presumably. And uh, we did see pine cones, of course. We did see pine cones, of course, uh, in the Toledo synagogue, in the uh, stucco capitals, but these are these are clearly grapes, and they're coming from a vine with 12 roots, and there are 13 clusters of grapes. Um, it is some people believe, and perhaps it is true. I I don't know. Um, the 12 uh, roots signify the 12 tribes of Israel rooted, and then maybe the 13 clusters are the 13 tribes because uh, Joseph is transformed into his two sons, uh, uh, Man uh, Manasseh and, and Ephraim. So my apologies for getting that wrong last time. And if you have any other corrections, um, I'm, I don't, my ego isn't, my ego is big, but it's not too big about these things. So you can feel free to correct me. And I'm, I, I, I'm delighted to have people pay attention and, and catch me out when they, when they can. Uh, I also want to thank a few of you for sending questions. Um, one of them I'll address a little bit today, and I'm continuing to pursue, and it concerns uh, the development of areas for choirs, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. Um, as you can see from this little collage or montage, uh, there's a great diversity of synagogue architecture in America. And I think that we have um, a range of styles and the numbers of buildings uh, certainly comparable to Europe. And uh, unbeknownst to most people, uh, we have a vast uh, collection of buildings, a, 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 a language of architecture um, that has been uh, buried uh, or, or lost uh, 
in, in, the, in the past centuries and, and decades through the abandonment of synagogues, their demolition and their, and their sale and reuse. Uh, that is in every way as um, dramatic and significant as the transformation of Jewish sites, of Jewish synagogues in, in Europe. Uh, albeit the, the, perp the reasons for it are, are entirely different. In Europe, of course, the abandonment of synagogues took place as people were expelled from cities and countries uh, century after century. Um, and then finally, we had the massive destruction of thousands of synagogues uh, and prayer houses during the Holocaust, when not only people were murdered, but their culture was, was uprooted and, and burned and uh, trampled upon. Um, and I've written about that in, 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 many, in many other places. Um, so we have only a fragment of what was once there in Europe, and what we have is often itself in fragmentary condition. In America, um, we have a similar type of transformation, but the transformation is not because of oppression, but because of opportunity. From the very get-go, when Jews first arrived in the 1600s as refugees, uh, fleeing Brazil, in fact, uh, and not planning to end up in New Amsterdam, which is now New York, but uh, coming ashore there, uh, Jews have found opportunity in America. And despite certain setbacks at times when there was, uh, you know, uh, uh, some anti-Semitism in some places against some people, um, uh, peaking in the late 19th century and in the interwar year and the 20th war years in the 20th century. Um, Jews, for the most part, have been free to go and do what they wanted and to form congregations as they pleased and to um, build uh, whatever they wanted, at least as long as they could afford it. Um, in the very early years, there were a few objections to Jewish construction. Uh, in Philadelphia, when Mikveh Israel wanted to build a synagogue on Arch Street in the 18th century, a nearby church complained that they didn't want to have the sounds of Jewish prayer. And that was something reminiscent of what we would hear in Europe at about the same time. But for the most part, Jews had opportunity and they were generally welcomed. And what we find going through much of the 18th and 19th century is when Jews built, their Christian neighbors actually joined in and helped them build and often made donations uh, to, to the synagogue. Uh, looking at the record books for both Mikveh Israel uh, during the time of the revolution in the 18th century in Philadelphia, and also Sheriff Israel for its various synagogues, but particularly its uh, early synagogues, uh, there's a, a, a good number of, of uh, Christians who are donating, and some of them are quite distinguished people in American history. So Jews have been integrated into society from an early date. They've had opportunity, and that means they've moved from humble buildings, and then when they've had the resources, they've built bigger ones, but also they have followed the migration of America from the coastal areas, primarily the East Coast. Um, we're not going to talk about the arrival of, of conversos, of, of uh, hidden Jews with the Spaniards and their settlement in the Southwest. That's another discussion, and it's one I'm not that um, educated about. Um, but uh, Jews moved from the, the East Coast, first from six main cities um, that were founded uh, early and in which uh, Sephardi Jews from Europe coming by way of Holland and England uh, found, uh, found refuge. Uh, Newport, New York, Philadelphia, um, Savannah, Charleston, and Richmond were these six. Uh, and then very quickly by um, the time of the of independence and the the expansion of the republic in the early years of the 19th century, Jews followed the American migration uh, over the Allegheny Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, uh, into the Midwest and the fertile lands of the Midwest, uh, settling on the main trade routes. Uh, at that time, they were mostly river routes, so establishing um, major Jewish centers uh, along the Great Lakes in in Cleveland and, uh, and then along the rivers in Cincinnati and St. Louis. Um, they also would follow uh, the development of the uh, slave trade, the slave routes in the South. And after having a uh, old and large community in Charleston, it was in fact in the 18th century, the largest Jewish community in America for a while, 
Uh, they also um, expanded in the late, um, uh, continued to expand in the 18th century in Savannah. And if, before long, uh, really by 1802, they were already established in New Orleans, which became a major uh, Jewish uh, center. And it's still one of the uh, three or four largest Jewish communities in the South, I believe. Um, we, um, we know a little bit about the early synagogues. Um, and most of these were uh, what we would expect of small communities uh, still in an unstable uh, new, uh, new uh, environment. Um, the first prayers uh, services were held in people's houses and that was allowed in New Amsterdam. And it really wasn't until 1730. So uh, over, um, over uh, seven, about 70 years, almost 70 years before Jews built their first uh, synagogue in around 1730 down on Mill Street in, in New York City. Um, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but we have this map, uh, a plan of New York that was uh, made in, in 1813 by uh, David Grimm. And along the top of that, notable buildings in New York are represented. And it's interesting that the synagogue is here. It's the very last building on the list. And it's extremely modest. It's like the Baptist Church and the Quaker Meeting House, very simple in form. And all of these actually are types of a Bet HaKnesset, they're places of gathering. They don't have a, um, they don't have the need for a more ostentatious and, and um, expansive uh, space for, for, for ritual. Uh, but the communities were very small so they could occupy small buildings. But you can see some of the other buildings including some of the other churches. Trinity Church is here, for example, are, are quite large. And these represent the Christian majority communities. Um, if you think about the long cycle, the long history of American architecture, we go through uh, American synagogue architecture, we go through about 300 years of, of styles. Uh, we're following other uh, uh, groups who are building both uh, privately and publicly. Um, and, um, but it's quite curious to, to go to New York today because we see just a few blocks from where that first synagogue was built on, on Mill Street, um, a continued Jewish presence, but one of the most uh, striking modern synagogues of the post-World War II period, uh, what was known as the Tribeca Synagogue, or, or, or what was known as Shari Zedek, it's now the Tribeca Synagogue uh, from 1967, uh, is right here in the uh, sort of Wall Street area. And it's not really too much bigger than that first synagogue uh, from 1730. We talked last week about the, uh, the rise of the Sephardim as they went from Spain to the Ottoman Empire and to, then to, into Portugal. And then from those two places, how they spread as, uh, as, uh, as uh, merchants um, to eventually settle in places like Venice and uh, Amsterdam, and I, I didn't mention Altona near Hamburg, but that was another place, and, uh, and London. And these traders very quickly became involved uh, in, the, in the transatlantic trade as well as the uh, pan-European trade and the uh, East Indy trade that would take people to, to Asia. Uh, and uh, Jews out of Amsterdam were very active in the, in the West Indies company, and that led them to participate in a lot of uh, economic endeavors in the Caribbean and in uh, South America. Uh, some of the first, the first uh, large synagogue, the, the remnants of which still remain, I'm not showing you, is in Suriname at a place called Yodnes Savannah, which was a, an area of Jewish plantations in which Jews and slaves um, you know, produce sugar and other and other commodities uh, for the for the uh, West Indies Company. But the big centers were in uh, Curacao and in uh, later in uh, in Barbados and some of the other Caribbean islands. And then we still have a nice collection of of synagogues in that in that area. Um, these are all daughter synagogues for the most part of the Esnoga, that great. Portuguese, Spanish, Spanish Portuguese synagogue from 1675 in Amsterdam. And many of them requested funds. They got liturgical objects, they got Torah scrolls, they got 
other types of support from Amsterdam and then subsequently from Beavis Marks in London, which as I mentioned last week was built in 1701. Um, the oldest surviving buildings of this Atlantic uh, Jewish community uh, are, the, are the building, the synagogue buildings in uh, Curacao and which, which um, this, the, the standing building dates from 1732, but it replaces several earlier iterations that were smaller and uh, less durable. And then we have the Turo Synagogue from uh, Newport, no, New, Rhode Island, which was founded in, which was founded, built, sorry, not built, founded, which was built in 1763. Uh, we'll look at both of these in, in a minute. Um, there, there, recently, there's been beautiful photography of the Caribbean synagogues by uh, a, a photographer named Wyatt Gallery. And I know he had several exhibitions. I think he may have a book out. I haven't seen it. Um, but that will give good access, good views of all of these remarkable buildings. Um, and uh, there is some great documentation on the Jewish community in Suriname as well. Uh, that was done by Rachel Frankel, uh, who is active in the International Survey of Jewish Monuments, and uh, Aviva Ben-Ur. Uh, they documented all the cemeteries, they documented the synagogue, and there's two wonderful volumes uh, on that, on those buildings and on those, uh, those funerary sites. Um, so, and those were the exteriors we saw. When we look at the interiors of these buildings, um, and I uh, we, we see that there's a certain similarity. They all have large uh, classical columns. Uh, they all have upper galleries and they all have seating that is parallel to the long walls of the building, uh, of the rectangular building. And then at opposite ends on the short walls are placed the, uh, the Ark uh, or the Arona Kodesh or the Hechal as it's sometimes called in Sephardi tradition. And uh, on the other end, the, uh, the bima or the teva, as it's also sometimes called in the Sephardi uh, tradition. This is that same bipolar plan we saw in, in Venice, and it becomes the dominant form of spatial organization for the early Sephardi synagogues in the United States, uh, sorry, in North America, as well as the Caribbean, even when the Sephardi are no longer in the majority in these congregations. And to a large extent, it becomes a accepted and sometimes preferred spatial arrangement for uh, American, uh, for many American Orthodox congregations going forward. So even today, you'll see some, some more recent uh, synagogues, uh, both Orthodox and, and even uh, conservative, which, which have this arrangement. The Kingsway Jewish Center in Brooklyn comes to mind and also the, the new synagogues uh, in La Jolla, in San Francisco um, by uh, Stanley Seidemann, the, 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 the architect. So it's, it's, it's a plan that has its advantages. One of the advantages, and you see it here in this, in this uh, painting from, from Amsterdam, is that allows a lot of uh, communal uh, ritual, processions and other sorts of gatherings um, where people actually are out of their seats and they are um, moving back and forth between the two poles of greatest activity. Uh, and the people who are seated along the side, imagine you're sitting here in, in Beavis Marks or you're sitting uh, here in, in uh, Temple Emmanuel in, in uh, Curacao, uh, as the action takes place, and I'm sorry, I don't have a plan, um, between the arc and the bima, you're sort of moving your head back and forth. You know, it's like being at the a tennis match. You know, Forest Hills, the national, uh, the, the U.S. Nationals, um, and 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 that that dynamic energy is is something that is lost later in the 19th century when many American congregations transition to a more theater-like arrangement where you have. Uh, all of your ritual at one end, and then the congregation seated, watching it from another side. And we'll see that we'll see that development. Um, also, the galleries women are uh, allowed in all these synagogues, but only in the upper levels. And you'll see the American synagogues very quickly open up the women's sections, 
a little bit more. And we have many contemporary accounts, uh, usually by non-Jews who are visiting the synagogues as uh, ex exotic places to go. They're kind of culturally slumming. And they're always impressed by the women in the galleries, many of them who they, who they describe as being very attractive. And it's significant that they can see the women uh, from the seats down below, which is something that was not allowed uh, even in Amsterdam, wasn't allowed in Livorno. And today it's not allowed in the more ultra-Orthodox in the very from congregations in, that I've been to in Brooklyn and other places. And, uh, and we saw in Paris how the uh, Rue Pave synagogue had been closed off. So there was no visibility from below into the women's section. But Americans were much more open. And in this, they were no doubt influenced by current Protestant uh, traditions where uh, they did use galleries. Uh, the galleries were actually more for servants and slaves and others, but there was much more um, transparency and uh, connectedness between the, the lower part of the space, the ritual space, and, and the upper. Um, I have actually been to this synagogue, but unfortunately my, my photographs can't catch, don't catch the wide angle, the sweep of the area. So I'm using these, um, these uh, from a book and, and I apologize for the, for the seam, but one of the notable things here is the sand floor. And I'm sure someone will ask about this. And my short answer is, I don't know why there's a sand floor. Everyone says, why do the Caribbean synagogues have sand floors? We don't know for sure. There've been about four or five interesting reasons put forward. Uh, sand reminds us of the wandering of the Jews in the desert, you know, after Sinai. Uh, sand was what people put on the floor in Spain or in Portugal. So uh, it would quiet the steps when a congregation was gathering. Uh, so the neighbors wouldn't hear. Um, sand is uh, practical. It's very easy to clean. Uh, so you can just rake up all the, 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 the garbage. Uh, we don't actually know. Nobody's left us a, an account of why they, why they put it there. But the sand in, in many of the Caribbean synagogues these days is regularly cleaned and replenished. And it's a major draw for tourists as a yet another uh, unusual, uh, even exotic aspect of, of, uh, Jewish, uh, of Jewish architecture and of local color. So Jews from the very get-go used the best architects they could find. We have no Jewish architects uh, in, in the United States, in, in North America, in, in the United States, uh, at least until the mid-19th century. We have a, a builder, David Lopez, in Charleston, uh, fairly early in the 1800s, and we have some uh, architects coming from Europe who we will meet shortly uh, who were Jewish. Uh, the first uh, successful Jewish-born architects, uh, American-born Jewish architects, um, are of the generation born just before the Civil War, and they don't become active as successful professionals until the 1870s and, and 80s. Um, before that, Jews would use the best architects they could find, and in Newport, they used an architect uh, named Peter Harrison, who was one of the foremost colonial architects. And in, uh, in Newport, you can see many of his buildings, including the Redwood Library here, and the old, I think this was the council building, it's now uh, the Museum of Newport History, and then there's, there's Toro. And here we see various views of it. Um, and it's, um, it's had a storied history. It's uh, played a role in uh, Jewish pride and identity at many different times in, particularly in the 20th century. Uh, there's a stamp that commemorates it. And uh, you can, you know, there, there, there's a lot written and easy to find information. Um, Charleston may be uh, just as well known, but, but the history is a little more complicated uh, because there were uh, two different buildings. The first was erected uh, in the early 1790s and it burned down uh, in the Great Charleston Fire of, uh, of 1838, I believe. And uh, we, we th obviously there were no photographs of it. We're lucky to have a few sketches and then a few images uh, done from memory by the Jewish artist Solomon Carvalho. 
Um, and this is probably what it, this is what it looked like originally. This is the earliest drawing and you'll see there's just a plank fence. Then there's a later drawing where there's a very beautiful iron fence, uh, which still survives today with the later building. Um, and here we have that same Sephardi arrangement, although it seems as if, and we don't know whether this is just the artist's uh, interpretation to make it fit on the panel, or whether it actually was uh, like this, the teva, the bima, is closer to the ark. And some people believe that this is an accommodation uh, to adjust the arrangement as a compromise between the Sephardi and the growing Ashkenazi population in Charleston at that time. These would be Jews from Central Europe and Poland uh, who would join the congregation. Um, these are probably wooden posts. Uh, they look like cast iron, but cast iron wasn't used at that time for this sort of work. Um, but we have a three-aisled uh, interior with a barrel vault. And I didn't point out, but in, in uh, Temple Emanuel at uh, Curacao, there's also a wooden barrel vault. And uh, it's very similar to the one in Amsterdam. And it's believed that it was actually either brought over or was built by the shipwrights um, but it's connected with the shipbuilding trade in Holland, uh, just, as, just as the wooden vaults in Amsterdam are. So the Sephardi history is one strand in America, and uh, it's best followed in New York because you can see all the different buildings of Sheriff Israel, the remnant of Israel uh, congregation that was began with 23 refugees um, in the in the 1650s um, and then uh, is given physical form in 1730. We don't know exactly what the Mill Street Synagogue looked like. Uh, this is one artist's interpretation. Um, we see it in a, in a second version uh, or later version in the in that um, map that we looked at. Uh, this is the Crosby Street Synagogue. It's a classical style synagogue. Looks like the, a little bit like the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, the so-called Temple of Fortuna Virilis in the Forum Boarium in Rome, or maybe like the Temple of Athene Nike on the Acropolis. It's a little Greek temple type building. And we also have an interior view. These were drawn when the building was going to be, uh, was being left by the congregation. I was probably would be shortly torn down. I don't know what it's, when it was demolished. Uh, and the congregation moved uptown to 19th Street to this uh, two-story building that looks very much like a late uh, 16th century, early 17th century Roman building designed by Carlo Moderno or someone like that. It uses Renaissance and sort of proto-Baroque elements. It's significant because it has a large dome. It's not the first synagogue in America with a dome, but it's, it's one of the first where the dome is actually visible from the street. And then we have uh, another building built uh, uptown at 70th Street uh, in, in 1896 um, in the classical style. And we'll talk about this next week. And then even now we're having new buildings built by a newly defined and greater, larger Sephardi uh, community. Uh, and we have the Sephardi Community Center out in, in Brooklyn. The definition of Sephardi has, has grown. So at first it was just Spanish and Portuguese, uh, but over time as more immigrant groups from the Sephardi world and what we now call the Mizrahi world come to America, whether they're coming from Turkey or from Iraq or from Iran or from, um, you know, wherever, um, they're kind of embraced in this non-Ashkenazi uh, 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 Federation, if you will, or 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 or, or a collection of, of communities, and and that is um, that allows new new uh, new facilities to be erected. We have Syrian synagogues, we have um, Moroccan synagogues, um, not all of whom really are, are 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 Sephardi by definition, but they're all all sort of covered by that by that label. Um, this is the Crosby Street synagogue that I mentioned from 1834, and it is built at a time when classicism becomes the norm, and we'll explore that in just a minute. Um, and in, 18, in the 1820s, that structure of these original uh, congregations breaks down, 
and uh, we begin getting splinter congregations, uh, a process that has never stopped, you know, two Jews, three synagogues, that's the rule. And in this case, the first break off from Sheriff Israel in New York is a little congregation, primarily Ashkenazi. Um, they have a lot of complaints about the old leadership and they form a B'nai Jeshur, a congregation that is still very active on the Upper West Side of New York today. They buy an old church. It's actually an African-American mission church, the Elm Street Church, and the tower is from the church and probably the building behind. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's possible, and David Kaufman is exploring this idea that the, uh, the building is transformed and given a classical front when the Jews take it over in 1826. Um, it wouldn't be uh, out of, uh, out of it, it would be in, in, in keeping with the, with the styles of the time. And you can see this print that was published in 1829 in the New York Mirror actually shows that most of the new buildings, the civic buildings, public buildings in the city of New York, all, all but one are, are built in the classical style. So that Jews, even though they're buying an old building, maybe cheap, uh, they're renovating because they wanna be up to date. And that's something that we'll see a lot going forward. Uh, the the uh, synagogue in Charleston burns down, as I mentioned, and a new building is erected uh, that is much more overtly classical and overtly Greek. And it's part of a very strong um, movement to create uh, uh, Greek temple style buildings for churches and for public buildings. And generally we say it's, it's, it's a, a recollection of the democratic uh, foundations found in ancient Athens that are being applied in the New Republic. Um, it's also partly due to uh, rediscovery through the Grand Tour and the, you know, Byron is going to Greece, the revolution is in Greece in this time. There's, there's a lot of interest in Greece and the Balkans. Uh, also, um, the, 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 the thing about Greek architecture, it's very regular. Uh, so you don't need an architect to really design, you don't need an architect to design most Greek revival buildings. Most of them are built of wood and all you need are good carpenters who can churn out wood elements in Greek forms and then these are put together just like we put Legos together or Tinker Toys together today. And we have the first architectural handbooks are circulating in America at this time around the 1830s and these are for carpenters and they are filled with designs for Greek revival. So this is dramatic in, in Jewish history that we begin getting more and more classical style or Greek temple style buildings uh, for a synagogue, which is not really a temple at all, but it is really uh, the norm for building in America at this time. So the Greek revival is very much an American style of, of the, uh, 1820s, 30s, 40s, and even into the 50s a bit in the United States. Now, one of the remarkable things about Beth Elohim, it's known as KKBE, uh, Kila Kadosha uh, Beth Elohim, the, the Holy Congregation House of God, is that it has a low dome on the inside. And this is quite new in America. And this is an innovation in the Greek revival that Americans do they combine sort of Roman domes or or in this case it's kind of a Robert Adam English style Georgian style dome uh, over a Greek temple uh, design. Um, what it does it unites the space and it creates a big open space so we don't have those aisles that we had in the earlier uh, in the earlier Beth Elohim which separates the people. Uh, by mid-century we begin getting uh, new seating arrangements and uh, though this isn't exactly as it was in the original design, we do get pews that are facing front and we have almost all of the uh, action, the activity focused on a bima and a uh, arc that are now uh, close together, they're combined. And eventually what will happen in many congregations within a short time is we'll, we'll, we'll build a whole stage like area and that will become the bima and the arc is there and all of the liturgical uh, functions will will emanate from there. Here we at least still have 
seats on the side and there's a sense of, of, of communal involvement. And then the, the circular form of the dome allows that to also um, be felt. I don't hear anybody asking about the stained glass windows because I don't hear anyone, but the stained glass windows here are interesting. Um, these are replacements. Uh, they were clear windows originally, but there was a hurricane that came through uh, in the 18, late 1870s, I want to say. Um, and these windows were put in afterward. And what they are is one of the first, um, not the first, but one of the first full series of stained glass windows in an American synagogue. We've been getting colored glass in synagogues since about the 1840s, but only just a few symbols. Um, and these are for windows and then in the windows are different symbols, but all the symbols are taken from um, their Old Testament uh, references and they're almost all taken from Christian uh, illustrated Bibles and uh, theological books, mostly German. And so these are symbols that would be recognizable to Jews and Christians, but Jews have only taken the ones that are applicable uh, to, to, uh, to Jewish religious uh, beliefs and purposes, but they tend to be heavily um, uh, about the temple um, because uh, there's a fascination in reconstructing, reconstructing the temple and all of its implements in uh, 19th century illustrated Christian literature. Um, we have a number of other classical synagogues, many built around the country, in fact, um, a few survive. Uh, one of the best is the Lloyd Street Synagogue, originally built as Baltimore Hebrew in 1845. It's gone through many iterations. Um, this is when I took a picture of the center one of not too many years ago, but now it's been plastered over uh, because that is believed to be the way it was originally intended to be seen when it was first built in the mid 19th century. It was meant to look like stone. And it's quite likely that the plaster was actually scored so you would see blocks of stone, uh, not just the sheer, the sheer plaster face. And again, this is just a little library around the corner done in the same style, just to show that these were part of the, of the architectural vocabulary of the time. Um, this is a little synagogue in Cumberland, Maryland. I've never been here and it's on my, on my, to go to list. Um, and it's from uh, just after, just during after the Civil War, about 1864. It's still um, a classical or, 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 or uh, but it's, it's a much more restrained um, design. And we have these applied uh, pilasters. It too was probably plastered all over originally rather than having just the exposed brick. Uh, plaster was both aesthetic to make it look like stone, so that was good, and it also protects the brick from water penetration and the erosion of the brick joints. Um, in the 1960s, we tended to restore everything, so we just saw the brick. Um, but what's interesting inside of this sort of federal style or uh, very, very austere building um, is uh, it has a, a, a organ loft and um, we begin seeing in the mid uh, in the mid 19th century um, permanent inclusions of organs in uh, reform congregations. Although reform wasn't fully defined at the time, but once you had an organ, essentially that made you reform. Um, and probably you had spaces for uh, uh, singers as well. Uh, I'm just looking at this now, and we'll see a few buildings where there are clearly some choir lofts as well as organ lofts. But this, this transforms the, the, uh, the synagogue or uh, the temple as the, reform, uh, as the reform synagogues are now coming to be uh, called. You can also see there's stained glass windows uh, and we can see that there is a, uh, a theatrical arrangement with the ark and the bima combined at one end. And uh, I don't know, these are not the original pews but we do have, um, after the Civil War, we begin getting the first instances of curved seating, of semicircular seating, because as we begin getting this performer audience arrangement, um, there are efforts to try to bring people uh, visually uh, closer. Uh, the, 19, the 19th century is a period of uh, rapid uh, stylistic change. And I'm just going to run through a lot of examples very quickly. 
um, they have fads for a little while. It might be a single architect is promoting something, or it might be that the community has some kind of uh, rationale. Uh, in Philadelphia, there are two examples of, group of Egyptian revival synagogues done by two very prominent architects, uh, William Strickland, who designed the Bank of America and other great, uh, uh, the first bank, uh, sorry, the first bank in, of the United States in Philadelphia, um, very important building, a Greek temple style building. Uh, Thomas E. Walter, who went on to design the, the dome of the Capitol building in Washington, DC. They design synagogues and they're using Egyptian motifs. Uh, this is, uh, seems odd since Jews were slaves unto Pharaoh and left and left Egypt. Uh, but in fact, uh, there was a, a common belief uh, at the time that the, um, and, and Thomas E. Walter taught Sunday school for his Presbyterian church. And he, he certainly promoted this idea that the architecture of the Israelites was Egyptian because they came out of Egypt and therefore the Temple of Solomon would have looked like an Egyptian building, even though it was built in Jerusalem. Um, one of the longest lasting styles is the Romanesque revival, or what the Germans call a Rundbogenstiel, the round arch style. And this actually is preferred by Jewish communities in Central Europe already from the 1830s. And it ties in with the local vernacular architecture. It is very not ostentatious, it is not um, uh, exotic. It, it looks like it should be German and it look, looks like it could serve any type of building. It could be a school, it could be an academy, it could be a hospital, it could be uh, a public uh, building and even a church. Um, and Jews push for this kind of building. And in fact, it was a Jewish architect who in the end won a kind of style war in Kessel, Germany that allowed this building to be built. It was widely illustrated and circulated in many different publications and prints, and it was well known in America. And it certainly influenced uh, the development of this Rundbogenstiel or the round arch style, the Romanesque style, uh, in America. And in the 1840s and 50s, we have a lot of examples, most of which don't survive anymore. But the former uh, Road of Shalom uh, on Clinton Street in the Lower East Side of New York does survive. You see it on the right here. Um, and this is what it looks like now. It's been restored uh, back in 2007 or remodeled, and it's now the Orthodox Shul of uh, Hassan Sofer after the great Slovak or Czech. Czech Slovak um, rabbi from, from uh, Bratislava. And uh, it's notable that we have these, what we call corbel tables, this sort of Romanesque uh, application of these little arches, but also we have these two towers. And the two towers become very common from the mid 19th century on. Uh, we find them in European buildings too, uh, and they are uh, generally um, meant to recall the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, perhaps they are recall the Yaquin and Boaz columns flanking the entrance to the temple. But from a practical point of view, what they do is house the stairs that allow women to go up into the upper uh, level, up the gallery, so that, um, so that the uh, the men can go directly into the prayer hall below and the women don't have to go into that space. They're separated as soon as they go in the door. In European synagogues, you often had a separate entrance for women. That's not usually the case in America. And you see how it's on a high half basement. This is the norm for most 19th century urban American synagogues because this is as close as we get to a synagogue center uh, Underneath in the basement area is where you have your offices, your classrooms, usually the maybe a Beit Midrash, a place where people can pray and study every day. And, uh, and uh, it's lit, uh, but not well from above. Uh, so here are some views of, of Rodo Shalom. This picture from the newspaper of the time exaggerates the size. It is not this lofty. Uh, there's a picture from 2006 uh, on, the, on the right, lower right, gives you some other, better sense of the size. Um, and uh, there are many other examples. This is the third build, building of Mikvah Israel in Philadelphia, 
And here's an example from uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, in, in both of these cases, we, I show you only the outsides because generally we do not have pictures of the interiors of most 19th century synagogues. Before there was photography, uh, only if there was an engraving appearing in a newspaper when it opened, are we like to have any type of illustration. And even when there's photography, because photography is forbidden on Shabbat and holidays when the synagogues are most in use, um, there are very few occasions when we have photographs. So only a small percentage of synagogues are documented even with an exterior photograph and an even smaller percentage with the interior. Um, this is not a synagogue I know a lot about. It's destroyed, it's in Hartford, Connecticut, but it is typical of the, of the late 19th century, the culmination of this sort of Romanesque uh, round arch style with the towers uh, that, we, that we saw from the 1850s. It's much bigger, um, but you can see all the component parts are here. We also have painted decoration of curtains, which is going to be typical for the synagogues of East European uh, arrivals. Um, and I show you this because I'm just going to show you very quickly a lot of other uh, examples in one slide. I'm using up a lot of time, so I have to move forward. Uh, here we see 1820s, how we're moving into the Midwest. By 1882, with the arrival of the first Eastern European Jews uh, from the Russian Empire, and we're moving all the way across the country. After the Sephardi arrivals, we had in mid-century, in the 20s through the 50s, a lot of Central Europeans, Bohemians, Germans, Alsatians, and they're settling in the South here and in the Midwest, but even out into the West. And we begin getting communities in every major urban center. This is just a random selection. I really didn't work hard to pull these images. Uh, I probably could have made uh, six or seven pages easily, and they look like Zoom pages, and we could just go on and on and on. These are all synagogues built between 1880 and 1910, I believe, 1920. And you can see they're all variations on that design from Hartford that I just showed you. This is a different synagogue in Hartford, which is now the um, the uh, Charter Oak Cultural Center. Um, but we have similar arrangements even in simple little wooden synagogues. So for those of you out in Southern California, I felt obliged to give you this from San Diego, uh, the first building of Beth Israel. Uh, it's now in, the congregation's now in its fourth building, I think, um, up by University, uh, is it University Park or University Center? Something. Um, so there was also the Gothic style. The Gothic style is often ignored and there's a sense that, oh, Jews didn't like Gothic because it was so Christian. Well, that's nonsense. Uh, the Gothic style was wildly popular in America, particularly with the German immigrants, because this is the style that they knew. The thing is, these congregations have been fantastically successful over the years, so most of their early buildings have been torn down. So this is just a sample. In New York, we still have the old Anche Hesed, um, designed by an interesting German architect, Alexander Salzers. A lot of people think he may be Jewish, but I, the evidence never turns up that he is. Uh, but if someone has such evidence, let me know. You can see it originally had two towers. Now it survives as a, as a kind of Jewish cultural center, the Orenson Center, and there are congregations that meet there. Uh, but we also have the transformation of churches like uh, this one, uh, a Baptist church that, that was uh, transformed by the early Temple Emmanuel, then a small German uh, kind of radical reform congregation. And when they took it over, they adopted most of the spatial uh, arrangements of the church. And that was something that accelerated this separation of the congregation and the clergy. And it also allowed seating of men and women together because there are no galleries here. And that then becomes the norm for the reform movement. Uh, we have a lot of variations of the Gothic and I won't go into them all, but uh, the most dramatic is probably in Savannah with Temple Nick for Israel, which was built in the 1870s. Um, the stained glass is some of the earliest, the stained glass here in the uh, apse uh, where the ark is. Uh, and then later, uh, stained glass from the late 1890s, memorial windows from the early 
um, uh, 19, uh, uh, 1900s. But um, this, the reason for this Gothic is because it corresponds to another building and it's supposed to blend with a lot of the churches. Most of the squares in Savannah have churches and this one is a Jewish church and it fills the square just like all those churches do. If you've never been here, it's well worth the visit. It's one of the most splendid uh, synagogue spaces, but one of the most un unusual. And they've expanded in the rear now and there's a nice museum of the congregation. Uh, so Gothic, lots of Gothic examples. I'm not even naming these. We find them in small towns, we find them in cities, but virtually none of them are still used as synagogues because these congregations have moved on. And then uh, we need to look, oh, 4.30. Okay, um, the Moorish style, we looked at um, at length uh, last week in Europe, and we mentioned all of these synagogues, the Temple Gaza, the Dorney Street Synagogue, and the Hronenberger Strasse Synagogue. These were the new things from Europe in the 1850s and 60s. And right after the Civil War, when Jews began to really expand and build, they amassed growing population with German immigration and also a lot of wealth. They looked to the newest thing in Europe. And while in um, in in uh, Europe, Jews kind of had to accept the Moorish style. It wasn't something they invented themselves. They embraced it as something new and entirely Jewish here. Uh, we get it in Cincinnati. It's the home for the uh, growing reform movement under Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise. And we see this Alhambra. He called it the Alhambra, the Jewish Alhambra. And he planned for it to look this way. He planned for its painting. He planned for its stained glass window. It was a complete work of art. And it took, uh, took a long time to build and complete. But then it became a model for many other uh, buildings, for many other reform congregations for several different decades. And here we have a large organ and choir loft. Um, and then almost contemporary is the uh, Temple Emmanuel in um, Temple Emmanuel in in New York from 1868 with these first Jewish immigrant artists, uh, architects Leopold Eidlitz and Henry Fernbach. Um, this should remind you of the Runningberger Strasse Synagogue uh, in in um, Berlin, which was dedicated just two years before. Many of the same materials and arrangements were also included, and both of these buildings had space for choirs. Um, and I think this was a choir loft up above the, uh, the ark here, and you see it. Um, but uh, the choir under the Oranienberger Strasse uh, was, was lower down. But um, uh, this was the most uh, celebrated Jewish building in America up to that point, and it was well illustrated. And uh, it was like the Eiffel Tower or the, you know, some other... Um, uh, a monumental building of the time. Temple Emmanuel has gone through, uh, like Sheriff Israel, many uh, iterations, and many of you will know the giant building on Fifth Avenue at 66th Street, uh, designed, uh, built in 1929 through uh, 31. Um, in Philadelphia, we had Sheriff Israel, I mean, sorry, we had uh, Rodef Shalom uh, by the great architect uh, Frank Furness, and it's uh, entirely Moorish. And you can see a big organ loft and also a choir loft at the opposite side. So the organ is over the arc and the choir is at the opposite end. And then we have a number of large buildings built in New York and other cities at the time, um, most of which don't survive. So these have been lost to our visual vocabulary. We always go back to a few examples that we can visit today, like Central Synagogue in New York from 1872, uh, designed by Henry Fernbach, one of the architects of Temple Emmanuel, and based obviously on the Dohani Synagogue from Budapest. Terrible fire in 1999, but it was rebuilt, and uh, they took that opportunity to try to restore the original decorative uh, decorative program. However, the seating has been changed. It's it's not that's not original. So the Gothic um, and the uh, Romanesque and the Moorish all kind of merge into an eclecticism and uh, we see it through the country. We see a lot of interesting examples. I, I, I can't dwell on all of these, but these are all from the 1870s in cities around the world. And uh, we're not going to get to a lot of things today because I'm trying to pack too much in. Uh, and I see uh, Ari in his little picture there sort of 
thinking about the time. Um, but I want to end with then with the Elder Street Synagogue because uh, he put it in the advertisement, but I know he's been there and many of you have and, and are interested in it. Uh, the Elder Street Synagogue is interesting because it, it marks a flip of style from the, um, the uh, reform movement, which had embraced the Moorish as something new and something that could celebrate Judaism as a unique religion with a special history. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a style that they were proud of and they were breaking from the classicism, the Renaissance Baroque and federal Georgian tradition that the Sephardi Jews had, had uh, celebrated and continued to, to celebrate even later with classical buildings. Um, and they, uh, you know, they championed this. But then by the 1880s, uh, 20 years after Plum Street in Cincinnati, the, the, uh, the Orthodox say, well, well, well we're going to buy into this too. This is a Jewish style and we're Jews. We want to be as, as um, visible as our uptown neighbors, as the, as the uh, Reformed Jews, the German Jews who've been here a generation earlier. And we want to have uh, rich decoration and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a lavish interior to excite our new Americans, our new congregants. And um, a lot of money went into building the Elder Street City Synagogue uh, on the Lower East Side, uh, mostly uh, Polish and Eastern European Jews. Um, and they, it, was the, it was the biggest synagogue in the area for, for a long time. It fell into disrepair after World War II as most of the affluent Jews in the Lower East Side had moved out, but um, in the 1980s, it became the first major synagogue restoration project in the United States and a model then subsequently for restoration projects in Europe after the uh, fall of communism in 1990. Uh, ironically, it took until 2009 for this project to be finished. In the meantime, scores of projects in Europe were completed. The Temple Synagogue, the Dohani Synagogue, many other ones. Um, but finally in 2009, uh, Eldridge reopened uh, as a museum, not as an active synagogue, because by that time there just was no, even a small minion in the basement, there wasn't anyone there left to, to pray. Um, so now it's the museum at Eldridge Street. One of the dramatic changes that I'm not particularly happy about is the inclusion of a large modern stained glass window by the celebrated artist Kiki Smith uh, in, in the rose window over the ark. Now there had been glass blocks here that had replaced a window that had blown out in a storm in the 1930s and we didn't know what it looked like. But rather than estimating it or leaving it as it was as part of the history of the building, the, in the final act of restoration, after 25 years of meticulous work, boasting that the reason it was taking so long was that everything was being kept as it was, uh, this new element was introduced. And as you can see from this photograph that I took maybe two years ago from the Women's Gallery, it totally overwhelms the space. Uh, it is wonderful. It's a beautiful window and it is dramatic, but it, but it, but it changes, changes the look of the space. Um, so we'll stop, I think we'll stop there because um, uh, there is, uh, there are, will be some questions and I've spoken for I think 50 minutes, but um, uh, we'll, we'll pick up next week and I'll just, I'll include a little bit that I'm dropping off, particularly what I wanted to talk to you was about the small rural uh, immigrant uh, uh, synagogues, uh, many of which I've been working on myself recently to document the paintings and to help restore them. And we'll, I'll put that as the first, the first 10 minutes of, of the talk uh, next time. But if anyone wants to ask questions about those, I can also address that now. Okay, so thank you. Thanks for your, uh, for listening and for your patience. And I'm going to turn off the screen and if, uh, turn this back to, to Ari. Okay, I'm here. Just waiting for you to unshare the screen. <clears throat> the screen. Why am I not seeing my, there we go, stop share. Okay, there we go. Ah, so while people are chatting questions, um, most, most of the chats were from people who've been to some of these synagogues and how impressed they were again in person because the photos don't really do it justice. Uh, but I was gonna ask you about the smaller synagogues. So what you really showed us were the grand synagogues. And I'm gonna assume just like in Europe, the grand synagogues 
and maybe not in New York because it's unusual, but the grand synagogues, there was one grand synagogue or two in a, in a city. I don't know what the average is, but I assume the rest were the smaller synagogues. And when you get to other places, we don't have grand synagogues. I don't know, in Nebraska, maybe we do. Yeah. But um, so the, the, uh, my question was going to be, and maybe it's for next week, is, wh is what makes these, I mean, I, I guess what you're saying is what makes these synagogues American is just because they were copying the styles of other American buildings but they don't really look American to me. I mean, all these styles look European. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what, you know, what makes a synagogue really American. And maybe, I don't know whether it's the seating. Uh, so tell me what makes it American, American well, I, Jewish. I, I think the architecture of these are very American, but of course they do, they do uh, recall European styles. Historicism was the norm in Europe and America in the, in the 19th century. Um, there, the Moorish style, as it's interpreted in America, begins to get a little wild and wacky, uh, and we do get uh, a kind of eclectic mix of some late 19th century American architects like Frank Furness, uh, like um, uh, Adler and Sullivan in Chicago, uh, uh, and 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 they take they take aspects of the Moorish and the Gothic and they make it much more picturesque. There is a European equivalent, we call it Ruskinian Gothic, uh, but, it's, but it's something that is distinctly American and thrives for about 20 years, 15, 20 years, until the 1893 exposition, which is where I was going to begin next week, um, uh, and classicism, a new type of robust uh, Roman classicism, a very monumental thing that looks like universities and banks uh, and, and, and Washington buildings, you know, takes over from those little Greek, Greek temples. Um, they're all American because these are, the, these are the norms, these are the styles that other Americans were building for other types of, of, uh, of edifices, of other types of, for other types of uses. Uh, town halls um, were Greek revival or they were, they were Gothic or they were uh, Romanesque or they were finally in the 1890s, you know, classical again. Uh, the cycle goes goes through. Um, a, an entirely new architecture doesn't really uh, assert itself until the late 1890s, early early 20th century, and that's where we trace our roots today of modernism. And so Frank Lloyd Wright, who many think people think is the quintessential American architect, although he's you know much of his work is unique. Um, I mean, is part of that, but so is the arts and crafts movement, so is uh, industrial architecture, so is concrete architecture, the, you know, all of these, and we're going to find them used more and more in synagogues, though Jews are a little reluctant to embrace these things in the first decades. They still hang on to historicism, um, but like they invented a kind of new historicism with the Moorish which was rarely used in the United States, so it was uniquely Jewish, uh, they'll, they'll invent a new kind of Byzantine architecture, um, you know, in the 1920s as a modern style, but it has its roots in, 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 in history, but it had never been used in America before, so it's a distinctly, distinctly new. Uh, so what's American? Well, uh, Americans like change, they like variety, they like, the, they like new fashions in dress and in food, and in entertainment, and they're the same way about their architecture. As far as the interior arrangement, we have a much more freewheeling development of reform here, and that definitely creates a number of interior variations that do not get really codified until, again, the 1890s, early 1900s. Um, and every rabbi sort of dictated what would happen in his own congregation. Eventually, Isaac Mayer Wise and Cincinnati would dominate the reform movement and, 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 and this, there'd be a single prayer book and there would be a single liturgy, single musical program, and you could go to a reform congregation, a service from city to city and you'd feel exactly, you'd feel right at home. It would be as familiar as the Catholic mass for a, for a, for a Catholic. Um, Orthodox uh, congregations tended to reflect uh, for a long time their place of origin. So they still had the same service, but the accent of their 
of their of their of their Hebrew, the the um, the melodies they use for their tunes. Um, uh, a lot of things would vary from from place to place, and that's why the immigrant communities would have. Um, uh, many of them would have their own synagogues and they would, even from two towns from the same country, they wouldn't mingle. It would take another generation for their children to marry before all of these places went out of business and they merged to get bigger, bigger congregations. Right. What's amazing about New York City, and granted, you should know, I grew up in Boston, so I grew up hating New York. And I grew up, you know, and it was the 70s and the 80s, so you didn't even want to go to New York when I grew up. But since I now have done uh, uh, three trips, like grand adventures to New York, and many of you have been with me on these trips. And what's amazing is you, it, although many of the synagogues are gone, many are still there. So you get to see the evolution of American synagogues in New York. You just go from Lower East Side and you, and you go up and you can see these buildings. And from the, the oldest buildings that are, you know, that are still there um, to modern. It's amazing. And but when I moved to California and I moved to Orange County, it was like moving to nowhere. I mean, there's just nothing here. There's no history. We don't have history here. So I, I, there's one synagogue down in San Diego where they rebuilt it, and the exterior looks like an older synagogue. It's beautiful. But you know, uh, L.A. has some stuff. Yes, yeah, so I know that. But we don't go to L.A. too much from Orange County. So it's kind of sad for us not to have that history that we can go look at. Well, if you look, there, there is a Jewish Historical Society of Southern California, which, which uh, has put out a journal and does trace a lot of the, the history. There's a little bit more than you might imagine initially. Um, and w there are some small synagogues, the one in San Leandro and San Diego. But yes, uh, you know, there, there's the history that goes back to the, the 1849 uh, gold rush, but a lot of these structures don't survive. The cemeteries are there, though. Um, but if you look at my blog, I've written about three of the different, I believe I've written about three of the different uh, Beth Israel buildings in San Diego. There's quite a lot of history uh, in, each, in each iteration. And um, likewise in, in Los Angeles with Wilshire Boulevard and with, um, with Breed Street and with, with um, uh, many, many others, Sinai, um, they, they, they've gone through many iterations over a hundred years because we're now into 2020, uh, 2020, so some of these congregations uh, are over 100 years old. And um, even more than on the, on the East Coast, they want to keep rebuilding. Every generation wants its new building. So we, they discard their buildings like we, we you know, throw away an old sweater or a, or a, or a, or a suit that doesn't fit us anymore. Um, but, but the density of New York is, is, is special. And the density um, was because of immigration. And, but because of immigration, um, a lot of synagogues were left behind because with every generation, as you amass wealth and new opportunities present themselves, or as new transportation becomes available through the streetcar in Boston or the, um, or the Brooklyn Bridge and the Williamsburg Bridge in New York that allows people to go to Brooklyn, um, you know, the poorest people move out and new areas are settled. Uh, so we do have congregations that carry the immigrant traditions to the Bronx and to Brooklyn and New York, and they make sort of new versions, but fancier versions, more expensive versions of what they left behind. And then their children will move to Westchester and to Long Island and will build big suburban synagogues that will, some of which we'll look at next week. Uh, but, but I think, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I, I think you can find history uh, even when it doesn't poke you right in the eye, you'll, you know, you, you, you can, you can, you can dig around, dig around for it. I like, uh, but you have to drive around Los Angeles to find Jewish history. Uh, whereas in New York, you can walk. Absolutely. Right. So what's interesting to me is the evolution that you showed us from the Sephardi origins of the synagogue to the Ashkenazi origins. Most of us don't dive in Sephardi. I, I, there are some small Sephardi minions here or there in Orange County. There aren't many. Um, so most of us, I would assume, on this in this program, don't go to Sephardi. But, but I, I assume what we'll talk about next week is kind of modernist synagogues and what people are building now. And I think that people, it seems, are leaving. We're moving away from moving back, maybe, to a Sephardi concept of a of a synagogue that's built a different way, as opposed to a staged setting that we all are used to. And and the future of the synagogues may go back to the origins of American synagogues, which is interesting. I don't know if that's exactly what's going on, but I know the major complaints about how synagogues are built now. And it's basically, people don't like the structure that we're stuck with from the, the 
structure that has evolved with the stage separated from the people who are like in an audience. Right. And I wanted to, you know, I promised to talk about identity a little bit. Um, in the 1920s, which we'll see next week, uh, but even in the 1870s and 80s, uh, Jews wanted big buildings because they wanted to show that they were organized, affluent, and, and um, responsible. And they were committed to the civic, civic engagement and building big buildings in a, in a city with beautiful facades was one way to demonstrate that you belonged to uh, the larger community and that you believed in it. Uh, people didn't live in the suburbs and gated communities. You invested your money where you lived. And if you had a factory or a company, uh, you know, your workers lived nearby and you lived nearby. And you were all part of this general bigger world. Um, and Jews wanted to, to be part of a polity that, you know, when they could uh, to be considered the equals or at least, uh, if not the numerically, at least, um, as citizens with, with, with their Christian neighbors. They were very influenced by the propriety of Protestantism. So the sermon, the theatrical arrangement of the, of the interior, the play, the organ. Most of these migrate from American Protestant worship into Reformed Judaism. But, um, but Americans embellish these things and they change, the American Jews change these things to give them a distinctly Jewish flavor. I would say we're moving away from the theatrical, from the from the uh, that arrangement for sure. Not necessarily to the Sephardi. I think we're coming up with new arrangements. And almost every new synagogue space that I've visited, or I'm consulted about, um, some of them don't even build sanctuaries per se. They build multi-purpose rooms, and they have flexible seating. So for one week they can sit in a circle. Another week they can all be in traditional rows. Another week they can be facing each other, like in the Sephardi arrangement. Uh, another week, they, they can be doing yoga on the floor, have a yoga service. So, you know, a lot of opportunities are there. And the space is now, uh, the idea is flexibility, because you need to, to keep your membership to pay for your congregation, you need to have a big tent and to serve as many people as possible. Obviously, you know, the Orthodox in, in very small, confined and and traditional communities don't have these problems, but even they have to accommodate, uh, they, have, they have loss, but they also have high birth rates. So, uh, but in conservative and reform congregations, if you lose half your, half your children to either other congregations or out of Judaism or Jewish practice, you don't have a birth rate that's replenishing that and your congregation will eventually die. Uh, so they have to be inclusive and that's one of the, the, the new models. Uh, we don't hear about spaces being awe-inspiring anymore. We talk about them, people saying they're intimate. Uh, we don't hear about um, uh, so much about um, uh, well, we don't. They don't talk about size. They talk about spirituality. I mean, so they're they're, they're new buzzwords, and they're good for the next ten years. What what we'll be talking about in 2030, 2040, I just don't know. Well, we'll have you back online <laughs> in hologram to talk, talk to our group. Well, well, gonna, have so much, I haven't covered the material. So yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we, we'll wrap it up, I guess, with the following. You'll share some resources. You shared some great ones that Absolutely. I share with the group already. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And, and I want to give a shout out there. A couple people. Um, well, I mentioned that uh, Vladimir Levin will be giving three lectures. I, I, I don't think we were on with everybody when I said this, uh, starting, uh, I think, later this week or next week on synagogues of Eastern Europe. So I only touched on these last week, but uh, uh, Volodia, who's the director of the Center for Jewish Art at Hebrew University and the co-author of two very definitive books on the synagogues of Lithuania and the synagogues of Volinia in Ukraine, I'd say there's probably no one who knows more about Eastern European synagogues except his colleague and co-author, Sergei Kravtsov. Um, he'll be giving these lectures, so that'll be great. Um, I want to give a shout out to David Kaufman, who I saw in the audience. David's book, Shul with a Pool, which is about the synagogue center movement in the 20th century, is still go-to reading. And if you want to know about American synagogues, you should read that book. Um, and then he's written many articles about the synagogues of Maryland, the synagogues of Boston, and other places. Uh, and there are many other uh, terrific people I see in the audience uh, who have a lot to share. So I'll put some of these resources together.
and, uh, and people can, can pursue this. Uh, and if you have questions, specific questions, you can send them uh, via, our, via Ari, is that okay for now? Sure. And then, uh, it, you know, we, 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 we can follow up uh, from, from there. I guess we'll end by saying that Judaism is interesting and we've evolved. We're, we've been here for thousands of years, but, um, you know, we don't necessarily come up with new things. I don't think that we have a, a Jewish architect who's changed how synagogues look and then affected how churches look. We kind of look at what's going on in society, but our, maybe our, our strength is that we can look around, whether it's architecture, whether it's uh, our theology, our thinking, our, our creativity, our cooking, our traditions, and we absorb from what's around us and we make it Jewish and what goes on inside. So thank you for giving us a visual uh, support for that. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Again, sorry you can't go traveling and see these places, but look at all the great places to see in America. If you've never been to New York City, well, you definitely have to go sometime, but there are more places to go. I'd like to go to the South. I haven't been there yeah. and see some of these uh, great buildings in, uh, in, in the South and, and that part of our Jewish heritage. And I wanna, I wanna pay a visit back to uh, the synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, which I want to take my kids to when things get safe. So a lot to see, you know, Orange County, not so much, but we do have, yeah, we do have LA and, and other places. So we'll get there. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. See you Thank soon. You. Be safe. Please vote. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Vogelfangers. Sharon Geiger, I can see you as well. Jana from Czechoslovakia. Phyllis Gilmore from, I don't know, we'll say Irvine for now. Yes, we don't have great synagogues here, guys. Sorry, I mean, we have great synagogues. We don't have great synagogue buildings. A lot to read, enjoy, and, and lots to study. Lindy, we'll see you soon. Enjoy New York. Bye, guys. Louise Rosenstein, nice to help have you with us. Bye-bye. Okay.